الحمد للہ والصلاة والسلام على رسول اللہ وعلى علی وصحاب اجمعین اما بعد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم سنوریہم آیاتینا فی الافاقی وفی انفسہم حتی یتبین لو انو الحق اولم یخفی بی ربک انو الحق اللہ شہین شہید رب شہلی صدری ویسلی امری وَحَلُّ الْعُقْدَةُ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَ وَقَوْلِ The Honorable Chief Minister of Tarangano State The Honorable Educational Minister of Malaysia My respected elders and my brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greeting As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be on all of you. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be invited by both the ministers to the state of Tarangano as well as this Imtiaz School of Excellence. This is my sixth visit to Malaysia but so far I think is going to be my best visit, inshallah. The topic of this evening's talk is Does God exist? This talk of mine, Does God exist? is for three categories of people. Number one, those people who do not believe in the existence of God. Category 1, they are the atheist. Category 2, are those people who are not sure whether God exists, are silent as far as God exists, and they are called as agnostics. And the third category of people are those people who do believe that God exists, but they cannot prove to the others, the existence of Almighty God. And I believe that Tarangano has more than 95% Muslims, Alhamdulillah. So I believe the third category of people will be majority in the audience. And this lecture is also very important for the third category of people. Those who do believe in existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God but they cannot prove the same to the others whenever I meet an atheist who does not believe in the existence of God the first thing I do is I congratulate him you may be wondering why is Dr. Zakir congratulating an atheist the reason I'm congratulating him is because most of the human beings, they are doing blind belief. He's a Christian because father is a Christian. He's a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are Muslims because father is a Muslim. This atheist, he's thinking. He may be coming from a family which does believe in the existence of God or may not believe. He does not agree that God exists. He's thinking. He's not blindly following. But one may ask me, but even if he's not blindly following, why are you congratulating? The reason I congratulate an atheist is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, first part of the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. To the other non-Muslim, First, I have to prove to him the God he's worshipping is wrong, is false. Here, half my job is done. He already agrees with the first part of the Shahada, La ilaha. The only thing I have to do is illallah, which I shall do inshallah. And then afterwards, Muhammad Rasulullah, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. So here half my job is done. To the other non-Muslims, maybe I'll have to spend half my time 
in convincing them that the God that they're worshipping is wrong and then talk about the one true God. Here half my job is done. That's the reason I congratulate the atheist. The first question that I normally ask the atheist is what is the definition of God? For anyone to say God does not exist he has to know the definition of God. If he does not know the definition of God he cannot say God does not exist. Some people may agree with me most will not agree. Let me give you an example. If I say this is a pen for you to say this is not a pen you should know the definition of pen you may or may not know what I'm carrying in my hand but if you do not know the definition of pen you cannot say this is not a pen I'm aware some people will argue with me and say brother Zakir we know what you're carrying is a book so if we know what you're carrying is a book we need not know what is the definition of pen and yet we can say this is not a pen but I disagree with you for you to say this is not a pen you should know the definition of pen for example if I say this is a kitab you may know the definition of book and you know this is a book but if you don't know what is a kitab you will say this is not a kitab and you're wrong because kitab in Arabic and Hindi and Urdu means book so that is the reason for you to say this is not a pen you have to know the definition of pen if you do not know the definition of pen you cannot say this is not a pen in the same fashion for anyone to say God does not exist he should know the definition of God now all these atheists and agnostics who do not believe or doubt the existence of Almighty God they look around them that the gods their family members are worshipping or the God their friends are worshipping this God he makes mistakes this God he forgets this God he requires to eat this God he gets tired this God he requires to sleep the gods that the people worship they have human qualities so this atheist says why should I worship such a God and I I Zakir Naik I am a Muslim even I do not agree that God can make a mistake God can forget God can get tired, God requires to sleep, God requires to eat. God doesn't have human qualities. Even I reject such God. Therefore I say, La ilaha, there is no God. Now if the atheist rejects God because he has been provided the wrong definition of God, we Muslims have to agree with him. Even we do not believe in such a God. For example, if a non-Muslim comes and tells me I do not believe in Islam with, which is a religion which is merciless it is a religion that promotes terrorism it is a religion that is against women rights it's a religion that is illogical it is a religion which is against science I too do not believe in a religion which is merciless which promotes terrorism which is illogical, which is against women's rights, which is against science. But I as a Muslim, I have to correct the non-Muslim that you have a misinformation about Islam. And I'll prove to him that Islam in fact is the religion of mercy. It is derived from the Arabic word Salam, which means peace. It is against terrorism. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 32 that if anyone kills any other human being unless it be for murder 
or for spreading corruption in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity and if anyone saves any human being he has saved the whole nation this verse of the Quran clearly states that killing any innocent human being is prohibited so how can Islam be a religion of terrorism Islam is a logical religion it is for men of understanding that's the reason the Quran says the afala you minun will you not then understand will you not then believe do they not understand Islam is a religion which is equal rights to women it's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 124 that if any of you believers be it a male or a female if you have faith and if you do righteous deed you shall enter paradise Islam is a religion of logic Islam is a religion of science the moment we clarify the misconception from the mind of the non-muslim he will start appreciating Islam in the same fashion this atheist he has a wrong definition of God so what should we Muslims do we should give him the correct concept of God the best reply that any Muslim can give regarding the concept of Almighty God of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quote to him Surah Ikhlas chapter 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says Kul huallahu ahad say he is Allah one and only Allah hussamad Allah the absolute and eternal Lam yilid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufwan ad. There is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran. If any person says that so and so candidate is God, if that candidate fits in this four line definition, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting that candidate as God. Number one is, Kul huallahu ad. Say, he is Allah one and only. Number two, Allah is Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Number three, Lam yulad wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is he begotten. And number four, Walam yakul lahu kufanat. There's nothing like him. <coughs> this Surah class is the touchstone of theology. Touchstone, you know when you go to buy gold or sell gold and you want to know how pure is the gold so the goldsmith he takes the gold jewelry <coughs> and he rubs it against a touchstone and compares the color and then tells you this gold is 24 karat gold or you may say it is 22 karat gold or he may say it is 18 karat gold or he may say it is not gold at all because all that glitters is not gold Surah class is the touchstone of theology Theo means God logic means study theology means study of God Surah class is the touchstone of theology any God any human being worships put him to the test of Surah class if the God you are worshipping passes the test of Surah class, then you are worshipping a true God. If he fails the test of Surah class, then he is a false God. And I've given a talk on concept of God in Islam and concept of God in major world religions, which if any unbiased man who believes in a religion hears this talk, he will agree with the correct concept of God. But today, today in the world, we have many atheists for whom their main yardstick is science. They believe in science and technology. And many atheists come and ask me, that can you prove to me scientifically the existence of God? And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul, Yahil al-Kitab, 
say, O oh people of the book, Ta'alaw ila kalimatin sawa'im bainan o bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'uda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushrika bhi shayyo. That we associate no partners with him. Wala yattakhi zabaad dunabaad dan arbaabin minnun illa. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and patrons other than Allah. Fa inta wallah. Then if they turn back, Fakulu Shadu, say he bear witness. Be anna Muslimun that we are Muslims bowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse of the glorious Quran shows as a way how to speak with different types of non-Muslim. And this verse says, Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So when I'm speaking to an atheist, people ask me, what is the common term? The common term is la ilaha. There is no God. Therefore, I congratulate him. Now, for the atheist, as I told you today, his yastik is science. So let us try and prove to the atheist, through his yastik, science, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, existence of Almighty God. And while doing this, I will take the help of the last and final revelation of the glorious, the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious Quran. This glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in this lecture of mine, while I will prove, Alhamdulillah, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, with the help of the Quran, I will simultaneously also prove that this Quran, Alhamdulillah, is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. When I meet an atheist and he's unable to define God or his definition is wrong, I ask him a question. That if an equipment is bought in front of you, who no one in the world has seen before, who no one in the world knows about it, and if it's bought in front of you, and if the question is asked, who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment? I would like to repeat the question so that you understand better. That if an atheist is asked the question, and an equipment is bought in front of him who no one in the world has seen before no one knows about it before and if the question is asked who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this equipment what will be the answer what will be his answer some may say the creator some may say the manufacturer, some may say the producer, some may say the inventor. Whatever he says, it will be somewhat similar. Don't grapple with the words. He'll either say the creator will be the first person who knows the mechanism, the inventor, the producer, or he may say the manufacturer. Just keep this at the back of your mind. Then I'll ask him the question that how did our universe come into existence? And he will tell me that our universe was initially a primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, to stars, to sun, to planets, and the earth on which we live. I asked him the question, when did you come to know about this? He will tell me approximately 45 years back, in 1970s, when a couple of scientists got Nobel Prize for describing the creation of the universe. They called it the Big Bang. So I will tell him, what you are telling me about the Big Bang, about how the world came into existence, the earth came into existence, is already mentioned in my book, the Quran, 1400 years ago. It is mentioned in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. It says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan itratkan faftaknahuma. Do not the unbelievers see 
that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we closed them asunder. What you're talking about, what you came to know 45, 50 years back, is already mentioned in my Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned in the Quran? So the atheist may say, maybe it's a fluke. Don't argue. And ask him the next question. What is the shape of the earth? The atheist will tell me that previously we thought that the earth was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that if proved the earth was spherical. So the atheist tells me we came to know that the earth is spherical hardly hardly 450 years back i will tell him that what you came to know 450 years back that the earth is spherical is already mentioned in the quran 1400 years ago it's mentioned in the quran in surah luqman chapter number 31 verse number 29 it is allah it is he who merges the night into the day and merges the day into the night merging of the night into the day and day into the night can only take place if the earth is spherical if it was flat there have been a sudden change it's further mentioned in the quran in surah zumar chapter number 39 verse number five that it is he who overlaps the night unto the day and overlaps the day unto the night the Arabic word is kawara, means to overlap or coil, how you coil a turban down the head. Now the coiling of the night unto the day and day unto the night is only possible if the earth was spherical. It's not possible if it was flat. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30. Wal ard baad azalika dahaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth egg shaped. And today we know that the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And the Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is an expanse. And the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg. It specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And dahaha also refers to a place where the ostrich lays the egg and if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich that too is geospherical in shape it is flattened from the poles imagine the quran mentions 1400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical like the egg of an ostrich i will ask the atheist what you came to know 450 years back my Quran says 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that in the Quran? So he may say, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, maybe he's a very intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Ask him the next question. The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? So the atheists will tell you, previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. But after science's advance, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light, it's a reflected light. I will tell you. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein sun having its own light and moon having reflected or borrowed light. The Arabic word used in the Quran for sun is shams. Its light is always described in the Quran as Diya, Siraj, or Wahaj, meaning torch, blazing glory, or a shining glory. And the moon is called as Kamar in the Quran. Its light is always described as Munir or Noor, meaning borrowed light or reflected light. And this message that the light of the moon is reflected and borrowed is also repeated in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 5, as well as Surah Nu, chapter number 71. Verse number 15, that the light of the moon is borrowed or reflected. I'll ask the atheist, who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago, that the light of the moon is not its own light, but it is a reflected or borrowed light? The atheist may say, 
maybe your prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was very intelligent he was very well versed in science don't argue with him continue when I was in school I passed my school in 1982 I had learned in school that the Sun along with the solar system it did revolve but the Sun did not rotate about its own axis they say, is that what is mentioned in the Quran I said no, no this is what I learned in school this is what I learned in school about 34 years back I learned in school 34 years back that the Sun did not rotate about its axis but the Quran says in Surah Ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 33 it says it is Allah who has created the night and the day the sun and the moon each one traveling in orbit with its own motion the Arabic word yes describes the motion of a moving body if I use this word the yes is derived from the Arabic word sabaha which describes the motion of a moving body and if I use this word for a person on the floor it will not mean he's rolling it will mean he's walking or running if I use it for a person in the water it will not mean he's floating it will mean he's swimming similarly when it's mentioned in the Quran for a celestial body it does not mean it is flying it means it is rotating about its own axis imagine I read in school about 34 years back that the sun was stationary it did not rotate about its own axis and the Quran says 1400 years ago that the sun rotates but now after science is advanced we have come to know that the sun does rotate you can have the image of the sun on a tabletop and we find there are black spots and these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation indicating that the Sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation imagine what I read in school today after science said once we have come to know it is wrong that means hardly 30 40 50 years back we came to know that the Sun also rotates about its own axis and Quran mentioned this 1400 years ago who could have mentioned this in the Quran now the atheist he will pause he will not reply don't wait for the answer ask him the next question you ask him the next question that today the scientists they tell us the sunlight that we have is due to a chemical reaction that is taking place since billions of years and one day this chemical reaction will cease to exist and life on the face of this earth will also cease to exist Quran says in Surah Yasin chapter number 36 verse number 34 it says وَشَّمْسَ تَجْرِ لِمُسْتَقَرِ اللَّهَ Surah Yasin chapter 36 verse number 38 وَشَّمْسَ تَجْرِ لِمُسْتَقَرِ اللَّهَ the sun is running its course for a period determined مُسْتَقَر besides meaning a period determined also means a place determined that means the Quran says the Sun will only function for a period determined the other meaning a place determined today science tells us that the Sun along with the solar system is moving to a point in the universe in the Herculeans which is known as Alpha Lyra as the solar apex at the speed of 12 miles per second what science came to know today that the Sun is moving to a point determined and will be there for a period determined is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago who could have mentioned this in the Quran and the atheist will be silent don't wait for the answer ask him the next question that today science tells us the atmosphere that we have outside the earth it prevents it acts like a ceiling it prevents the harmful radiation the x-rays and the ultraviolet rays from entering the earth the surface of the earth if this would not if this was not there 
then life would not exist on the face of the earth. Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 32, that we have made the sky as a protected ceiling. What science discovered recently, 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back, 300 years back, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago that the sky has been made a protected ceiling. When I was in school, I had learned that there are three states of matter, solid, liquid and gas. And the scientists that time, they thought that outside the organized astronomical, astronomical system, there was vacuum. Today the scientists say that outside the organized astronomical system are bridges of matter which they call as plasma. And this they say is the fourth state of matter. Quran says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 11, it is Almighty God who has created the heaven and the earth and everything in between. Also says Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59, that Allah has created the heaven and the earth and everything in between. That means there are things in between the organized astronomical system, which today the scientists call as plasma, the fourth state of matter. According to Edwin Hubble, who was a very famous scientist, he discovered in the last century that our universe is expanding and it was one of the greatest discoveries of the last century. Our universe is receding from one another and Quran mentioned this 1400 years ago. It's mentioned in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47, that we have created the vastness of space, the expanding universe. The Arabic word is Mosiuna, vastness. Imagine what the scientists came to know recently, hardly 100 years back. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago that the universe is expanding. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? And the atheists would be silent. There may be certain skeptics who will say it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy. Since the Arabs, were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree with them that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I would like to remind them, it was centuries after the Quran was revealed that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it's from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of physics, about 23 centuries ago, there was a very famous theory known as theory of atomism. It was propounded by the Greeks, by the Democrats, and they believed that atom is the smallest part of matter which cannot be divided. And this was also known to the Arabs. This was also known to the Arabs, and in Arabic, it was called a zarra. Zarra, meaning an atom, a smallest part, according to scientists. But today, science has advanced, and we have come to know that the atom, though, is the smallest part of matter, having the characteristic of an element, it too can be divided into neutrons, into protons and the Quran speaks about Zarra so many people may think if the Quran speaks about Zarra as the smallest part and today science tells us that the atom can be divided that means the Quran is outdated if you read the Quran 
the Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 3, that when they tell you that the hour will never come, the hour of judgment, tell them it will surely come with the permission of thy Lord, in whose record is mentioned the smallest detail of an atom, talking about the Zarra, and even things smaller and greater than the atom. That means Quran already mentions that there are things smaller and greater than the atom. And this message is repeated in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 61. That when they ask thee regarding the R, tell them, the R will surely come with the permission of their Lord, in whose record is very clear, is perpetuous, things as small as the atom and things greater and smaller than the atom. So the Quran is not outdated, it is up to date. It tells in advance that there are things smaller and greater than the atom. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? In the field of hydrology, in school we learn about the water cycle. And the water cycle we learn in the school was first propounded by Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580. And we learn in school that the water evaporates from the ocean, it rises, forms into clouds, the clouds move in the interior, they fall down as rain, and the water table is replenished. We learn this in school. Previously, in 2nd century BC, Phils of Miletus, he said it was the spray of the ocean which was picked up by the wind which fell into the interior like rain. Previously, people thought it was the pressure of the wind on the ocean which thrust the water into the interior. We did not know how did the underground water come. So first people thought it was the pressure of the wind which forced the water into the interior and it went back by a secret passage known as Tartarus at the time of Plato. Even till as late as 17th century, Descartes believed in this. Even in 19th century, Aristotle, he propounded the theory that the underground water was due to the mountain caverns, they fedding these, the underground water. Today we know that the underground water is due to the seepage of the rain water in the cracks in the ground. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, seest not thou it is he who sends drawn water from the sky and leads it in cracks and grounds and causes sown field of varying colors to grow. Quran is talking about the underground water 14 years ago, which we came to know recently. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. The Quran says in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24, it is he who sends drawn water from the sky and gives life to the earth after it is dead. It's mentioned in Surah Minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. It is he who sends on water from the sky and is able to store it or even drain it. It's mentioned in Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. It says that it is he who sends fecundating winds, winds impregnating. The Arabic word lawaki coming from the word lakaha means to impregnate and today we know that science tells us that the pollen picked up by the wind impregnates the cloud and waterfalls and one more reason is that when the clouds join together and later on the water falls from the sky it's further mentioned in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 43 that the clouds rise, they join together, and then water emerges from the top, from the sky. It's mentioned in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 48, that the water rises from the sky, forms into clouds, the clouds move the interior, they join together, they make a heap, and the water emerges from the sky. The Quran 
speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several verses in surah araf chapter number 7 verse number 57 in surah rod chapter number 13 verse number 17 in surah furqan chapter number 25 verse number 14 and 49 in surah fatir chapter number 35 verse number 9 in Surah Gasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9 and 10. It's mentioned in Surah Waqiyah, chapter 56, verse number 67 to 70. It's mentioned in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 30. It's mentioned in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. There are verses I can keep on quoting only in the Quran which talk about water cycle. Who could have mentioned so much detail about the water cycle which we came to know in the 16th century, some of it and some of it recently? Don't wait for the answer, you can continue. Today in the field of geology, the geologists tell us that the earth on which we live, it's approximately little less than 4,000 miles in radius. And the deeper layer, they are hot and fluid and cannot sustain life. But the layers on top, it gets solid. And the superficial layer is a thin crust, hardly 1 to 10 miles in thickness. It's less than 1% in, in thickness. And there are high possibility that this superficial crust of the earth, it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena which gives rise to mountain ranges which gives the stability to the earth so today the scientists say it is due to the mountain ranges that the earth is stable the quran says in surah naba chapter number 78 verse number six and seven we have made the earth as an expanse while Jabal Autada and the mountains are stakes. The Arabic word Autad means stakes, means tent pegs. When you put a tent peg into the ground, the major peg goes deep in the ground. You see only a small portion above the ground. So similarly, the mountain that you see, the portion above the ground is a very small percentage. The major percentage is deep underground. Like how you see an iceberg. The iceberg that you see on top of the water is very small, less than 10%. The major portion of the icebergs is below water. Similarly, the mountains on top of the earth is a very small portion. The major portion is deep within the ground. The Quran says in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 32, and Surah Ghashiyah, chapter number 88, verse number 19, that we have placed mountains standing firm and when you read the book the earth which is one of the most referred book in the universities in the subject of geology one of its authors his name is dr frank press and he writes in this book the earth and he draws the mountain and he shows that the mountain has got deep roots and the roots are wedge shaped deep roots and the portion you see above is a very small percentage the major portion is deep underground and dr frank press who was an authority in geology was also the president of the academic science in usa and was also the scientific advisor to the previous president of usa jimmy carter he says that the function of the mountain is to prevent the earth from shaking which he told just 50 years back, 100 years back. And Quran mentioned 1400 years ago in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, as well as Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, and Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 10. Quran says, we have placed on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. So Quran describes the function of the mountain to prevent the earth from shaking, which we discovered recently. Who would have mentioned this in the Quran? In the field of oceanology, there's a verse in the Quran, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Furqan, 
chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says, We have let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other is salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier, there is a barzakh, which is forbidden to be trespassed. The message is repeated in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20, which says, Marajal bayreni al taqyan, bainama barzakh gyan. It is he who has let free two bodies of water, flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, the commentators of the Quran, they knew that there are two types of water, salty and sweet, but they could not understand what does the Quran mean by saying that these two waters meet, but they do not mix. There is a barrier. There is a barzak between them. Today, after science advance, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, whenever sweet water flows into the salty water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This area, homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as barzakh. Whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This homogenizing area, the Quran refers to as Barzakh. And this can be seen in several places in the world. If you go to Cape Town, that the southern part of South Africa, you can see these two waters meeting. You can even see the color between these two waters different. In Egypt, when River Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea, and the best example is the Gulf of Mexico, we start from the Gulf of Mexico. It runs for, it flows for thousands of miles. From the Gulf of Mexico, it goes northwards towards the east coast of North America, then flows, flows eastwards and goes towards the west coast of Europe. Though it flows for thousands of miles, both waters are distinct. And if you travel in a boat in the Gulf Stream and pick up water from the left side and pick up water from the right side, one is sweet and the other is salty. Even the temperature between the two, it differs. Further, when you read in the subject of Vaishnology, there was a verse in the Quran, Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 40, which was shown to Prophet Dr. Durga Rao, who is a marine, marine engineer and expert in the field of Vaishnology. He was teaching in the King Abdullah University in Jeddah. Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 40 says, As to the state of the unbeliever, it is like the depth of darkness. It's like the depth of darkness in a vast deep ocean. Waves topped with waves, topped with dark clouds. If a man stretched out, stretch, if a man stretches out his hand, he cannot see. For to whom Allah sends no light, he does not see. What does this verse of the Quran mean by saying the state of an unbeliever's mind is like the depth of darkness in a vast deep sea, vast deep ocean. Waves topped with waves topped with dark clouds. Darkness above darkness. If a, hand stretch, if a man stretches out his hand, he cannot see. For to whom Allah gives no light, he will not see. When Prophet Durga Rao was shown this verse, he said that this verse is not referring to a normal sea. It is referring to a vast deep ocean. And previously we did not know that the depth of the ocean was dark. Because the human being cannot go more than 20 to 30 meters unaided. It is in 1900 when we discovered submarines, we came to know that the deep part of the ocean, it is dark. Even the fishes which swim in the deep part of the ocean, they have their own light. And Professor Durga Rao said that this darkness is due to phenomena. Number one, when the light enters the ocean, the light is absorbed in layers. And today we know that the light has got seven components and we learnt in school about whip pure violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange and red it has seven components so when light enters the ocean 
the first 10 to 15 meters of the water it absorbs the red color so if a man swimming below 25 meters if he gets injured and if blood comes out he will not be able to see the red color of his blood and I remember when I had gone to Mauritius I had the opportunity of going in a submarine down so what I did, I took a Kit Kat paper, you know, which is red in color, Kit Kat, Kit Kat chocolate. And as the moment we kept on going down, when we went below about 15, 20 meters, the brown, the red color disappeared. It was like a dark, dark brown something, but I could not see red. When I took out my mobile and on the light, I could see the red color again, because the light was there. The moment I switched off the mobile, the torch in my mobile, it was again dark. It was in red. So I could personally, because the red color is absorbed by the first 10 to 15 meters. From 30 to 50 meters, the orange color is absorbed. From 50 to 100 meters, the yellow color is absorbed. From 100 to 200 meters, the green color is absorbed. And below 200 meters, the blue color is absorbed and violet and indigo also. So the light is absorbed in layers, part by part. That's the reason you see darkness in layers. As the Quran says, darkness on darkness. The second reason why there's darkness is, when the sunlight, before it reaches the earth, many a times, it is obstructed by the cloud. And the cloud absorbs it. And you see a dark patch below the cloud. This is one of the reasons that light is absorbed. And that which is not obstructed by the cloud, it reaches the ocean. And many a time that is reflected by the waves, you see the silvery. But the Quran says, waves topped with waves. What does the Quran mean by waves topped with waves? We see the waves on the superficial part of the ocean. It is recently, about more than 100 years back, 50 years back, 100 years back, 150 years back, we came to know that there are even internal waves. This internal waves, it separates the ocean into two parts, superficial ocean and the deep ocean. The superficial ocean is lit up and warm. The deep ocean is dark and cold. So the Quran says, the state of an unbeliever's mind is like the depth of darkness. Waves topped with waves, topped with dark clouds. Darkness above darkness. If a man stretches out his hand, he cannot see it. For to whom Allah gives no light, light will not reach him. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. It says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّا شَيْنَ هَيْ أَفْلَا يُمِنُونَ We have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, where there was scarcity of water. Who could have believed that every living creature is made of water? You could have thought of something else like sand, etc. But water? Quran mentioned this 1400 years ago. And today we have come to know that every living creature has a cell which contains cytoplasm, which contains 80% water. And every living, every living organism, every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. Imagine, Quran mentions this 1400 years ago. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, we have created every animal from water. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, we have created the human beings from water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know 
that even the plants have sexes, male and female. We came to know recently. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, it is he who sends down water from the sky and with it brings diverse pairs of plants, each separate from the other. The Arabic word is azwaj, meaning pairs, that means forces, each separate from the other. So Quran says that even the plants have got sexes, male and female. Quran says in Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that we have created every kind of fruit in pairs, twos and twos. The Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 36, we have created everything in pairs, the things you know and the things you don't know. Today, we have come to know even things like electricity. They are created in pairs, positive and negative. Even the atoms, like protons and neutrons, negative and positive. So Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse number 36, we have created everything in pairs, things you know and things you don't know. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? 1400 years ago. In the field of mathematics, there is something called as theory of probability. That means, if you make a wild guess, what are the chances that you will be correct? This is called as theory of probability. For example, and it says that the number of options you have and if one of them is correct, you divide one by the number of options, you get the probability. For example, if you toss a coin, it can either be heads or tails. If you make a wild guess, whether you say head or whether you say tails, the chances you will be right is 1 upon 2, it is 50%. If you toss a coin twice, the chances you'll be correct both the times is 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 is 50% of 50%, it is 1 upon 4, it is 25%. If you toss a coin thrice, the chances you'll be correct all three times is 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 is 1 upon 8. It is 50% of 50% of 50%, it is 12.5%. <coughs> If you throw a dice, there are six options. One, two, three, four, five, six. The chances that if you make a wild guess, you'll be correct is one upon six. If you throw a dice twice, and the chances you'll be correct both the times is one upon six into one upon six is one upon thirty-six. If you throw a dice thrice, and the chances you'll be correct all three times is 1 upon 6 by 1 upon 6 by 1 upon 6 is 1 divided by 216. This is called as theory of probability. So if someone says that someone wrote the Quran and by chance, fluke, he got it right. Let's analyze the theory of probability. For example, if you ask, what is the shape of the earth? Maybe you can give 10 shapes. You can say it is square, it is triangle, it is hexagonal, it is heptagonal, it is flat, it is spherical. You can give 10 options. The chances if you make a wild guess and you are correct is 1 upon 10. The light of the moon, is it its own light or reflected light? There are two options. The chances if you make a wild guess you will be correct is 1 upon 2, it is 50%. The chances that you are right both the times the shape of the earth is spherical and the light of the moon is reflected light is 1 upon 10 by 1 upon 2 is 1 upon 20 it is 5 percent <coughs> chances will be correct the living creature the quran says we have created every living thing from water if you want to guess what are the living creatures made of you can guess 10,000 things. Wood, iron, aluminium, steel, wool, water, 10,000 things. The chances if you make a wild guess, 
and it will be correct as 1 upon 10,000. The chances that all three, if you make a wild guess, the earth is spherical, the light of the moon is reflected, and everything is made from water. The chances you'll be correct if you make a wild guess is 1 upon 10 into 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 10,000. 1 upon 60,000. 1 upon 60,000 is equal to 0.00017%. Only with these three, you get 0.00017%. And there are more than 1,000 verses of the Quran which speak about science. And not a single is against scientific fact. The probability will be 0 0.000, how many zeros I don't know. And today science tells us, if 10 raised to 50, 10 raised to 50 means 50 zeros, it is zero. So mathematically, it is improbable. It's not possible. It's impossible that someone makes a wild guess and all of it is correct. <clears throat> the Quran mentioned about several other scientific facts. Time will not permit me to say everything, I'll just mention a few more. In the field of zoology, Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, every animal that walks on the earth and every bird that flies in the air lives in community like the human beings. And today science tells us that the animals and the birds, they live in community like the human beings. Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that he has taught the bee to build its cells in hills, in trees, and in human habitations, and to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill. What does the Quran mean by saying that the bee has been taught to build, to find the spacious path of thy Lord with great skill? It was Sir Fawn Fresh. In 1973, who got the Nobel Prize for describing the behavior of the bee, and he said that whenever a bee finds a new flower or a new garden, it goes and tells its fellow bee the exact direction of the new flower or the new garden by a process known as the bee dance. Imagine, Quran mentions about this 1400 years ago, which we came to know recently, hardly 45, 50 years back. Furthermore, Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 16 and 69, the worker bee is called as Fasluki, meaning a female bee. Previously, we thought it was the male bee which was the worker bee. That's the reason Shakespeare, in his play, Henry IV, he says that the male bees are the soldier bee, and they report to the king. Today, we have come to know that the worker bee are the female bee and not the male bee, and they don't report to the king, they report to the queen. Imagine, Quran even mentions the sex of the worker bee as being female 1400 years ago. It's mentioned in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41, that as to those who take for protectors, anyone besides the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they build for themselves houses like that of the spider. For verily, the house of the spider is fragile. Besides Quran saying, if you take for protector anyone besides your Lord, you build for yourself house which is fragile, like the web of a spider. Today we have come to know that many a times the female spider kills the male spider, kills the husband, and is called as the black widow. So besides describing the fragility of the home of the spider, it even talks about the family relationship which is very bad. Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, that when Solomon and his army with hosts of men, jinns and birds, when they approached a lowly valley of ants, one of the ants said, O ye ants, get into your habitations, lest Solomon and his army will trample you beneath their feet. People may think, what kind of a fairy tale book is the Quran? The ant talking among themselves? Today we have come to know the animal or insect which has the closest resemblance to that of the human being, it is the ants. The ant bury the dead the same way as the human beings do. 
they have a sophisticated method of labor where they have a manager, a foreman, a worker. They have a very sophisticated method of communication. They very often meet to chat. They even have marketplaces where they exchange goods. You know, we have souk marketplaces. They have marketplaces where they exchange goods. And the ant, if it stored a grain, and if the grain began to bud, it chops off the bud as though it knew that budding will cause rotting of the grain. And if the grain got wet, it got it out in the sunlight to dry as though it knew that humidity will cause the rotting of the grain. You know, sometimes we see the ant carrying the grain in the sunlight. Then as a kid has to wonder where is the ant taking the grain. Science tells us when the grain gets wet, it gets it out in the sunlight to dry as though it knew that humidity will cause the rotting of the grain. In the field of physiology, there's a verse in the Quran which talks about the production of milk and the blood circulation. Blood circulation was first discovered by Ibn Nafis about 600 years after the Quran was revealed. And 400 years after Ibn Nafis, William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. Today in our school books, we learn about William Harvey, but we don't know about Ibn Nafis. It was Ibn Nafis who first discovered the blood circulation. William Harvey, 400 years later, 1000 years after the Quran was revealed, he made it famous to the Western world. Quran, 1000 years before, before William Harvey, and 600 years before Ibn Nafis, says about the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell. Today science tells us that the food we eat, it goes into the stomach. From the stomach, via the bloodstream, it enters almost all the different organs of the body. Many a times goes via the liver, a very complex method. It even enters the mammary gland, which is responsible for the production of milk. This thing is mentioned in a nutshell in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 16, where the Quran says, Verily in the cattle is a lesson for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body. Coming from a conjunction between the constituents of the intestine and blood. Milk which is pure for you to have. The same message is repeated in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21. Verily in the cattle is an example for you. We give you to drink from what is within the body. Coming from a conjunction of the constituents of the intestine, milk which is pure for you to have. And of the meat you can eat. Imagine Quran speaks about the blood circulation and production of milk in a nutshell 1400 years ago. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, that from the belly of the bee, you get a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for humankind. Previously, we did not know that the honey was obtained from the belly of the bee. We came to know recently, about 200, 300 years back. Quran mentions 1400 years ago that from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for mankind. Today, science tells us that the honey has got mild antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers in World War II used honey to cover up the wound. There was very little scar tissue left and healing was done and due to the density of the honey, germs and bacteria was prevented to grow in the wound. And if a person is suffering from allergy of a particular plant, if honey from that particular plant is given to that patient, he starts developing resistance to that allergy. In the field of medicine, in the field of embryology, embryology is a study of the development of the embryo, the development of the child in the womb of the mother. In medical terminology, it's called as embryology, study of the embryo, study of the development of the human being.
In the field of embryology, there were a group of Arabs who collected the verses in the Quran and the Hadith talking about embryology and took it to Professor Keith Moore, who was an authority in that field, following the verse of the Quran of Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 43, and Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7, which says, First Alu Ahl Zikri in Kumdula Talamu. If you don't know, ask the person who's knowledgeable. So they took the verses of the Quran and presented to Keith Moore those verses which deal with embryology and the hadith. And when Prophet Keith Moore read these verses, he said that more than he said that almost all the verses in the Quran which talk about embryology a hundred percent in conformity with what modern embryology says but there are a couple of verses which I cannot say that they're right neither can I say they're wrong because I myself don't know and two such verses were the first two verses of the Quran to be revealed which says Ikra bismi rabbikal lazi khalaq khalaqal insana min alaq read, recite and proclaim in the name of thy Lord who created who created the human beings from something which clings a leech like substance so Prophet Keith Moore said I do not know whether an embryo looks like a leech or not so he went into his laboratory and under a very powerful microscope he observed the early stages of an embryo and compared it with a photograph of a leech and he was astonished at the striking resemblance and later on he said when about 80 questions were asked to him he said if you would have asked me this question this was in the early 1980s and late 1970s that if you would have asked me these questions 30 years before I would not be able to answer more than 50% because embryology is a new development embryology is a new development in the medical science and it was hardly it came about 70-80 years back this question was asked to Keith Moore in 1970s late 1980s early and 30 years before that the development of embryology started from 1950 about 65 years back he said if you ask me this question more than 30 years back I would not be able to answer more than 50 percent and furthermore the Quran says Quran says in the Tariq chapter number 86 verse number 5 to 7 that does not man think from what is created he is created from a drop emitted between the backbone and the ribs what does the Quran mean by saying human beings have been created from a drop emitted from the back between the backbone and the ribs and today science tells us that the genital organs in the human beings in the male the testes in the female the ovaries they originate initially in a space where the kidney is present between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib later on they descend during the embryonic life and then in the male they descend via the inguinal canal into the scrotum the ovaries and that is the testes and in the female the ovaries descend to the true pelvis but even in the adult life after the genital organ descend they yet receive the they receive the blood supply from the same space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib and the venous return goes back to the same space between the backbone and the 11th and 12th rib even the nerve supply comes from the same space furthermore the Quran says in Surah Mu'minun chapter number 23 verse number 13 and Surah Hajj chapter number 22 verse number 5 we have created the human beings from anutfa from a minute quantity of liquid minute means a very small quantity today science tells us that in a normal emission about 300 million sperms are emitted only one sperm is sufficient for the fertilization of the ovum Nutfa. the Quran further says in Surah Sajda chapter number 32 verse number 8 we have created the human beings from Solala the best part of the whole the one sperm out of 300 million sperm the Quran refers to as Solala the best part of the whole furthermore the Quran says in Surah Insan 
chapter number 76 verse number 2 we have created the human beings from nutfatin amshaj a minute quantity of mingled fluid and we know besides the ovum and the sperm there are spermatic fluids and other fluids which are responsible for the production of the human beings in the field of genetics today science tells us that the sex of the child is determined by the 23rd pair of chromosomes if it's xx it's a female if it's xy it's a male and it is the male sperm which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child if the X of the male takes part in the fertilization a female is born if the Y of the male takes part in fertilization then a male is born Quran says in Surah Najam chapter number 53 verse number 45 we have created the human beings from a minute quantity of fluid gushing forth from a male and then gave it sex male and female the Quran says clearly in Surah Qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 37 to 39 we have created the human beings from a nutfa minute quantity of liquid then made it into a mudga then we gave from a minute quantity of sperm the Arabic word used is we have made the human being from a minute quantity of sperm nutfatin min mani yumna and then gave it sex male and female so Quran says it is the sperm it is the male fluid which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child which I have come to know recently the country where I come from India they prefer having sons instead of daughters for reasons known best to them and if a daughter-in-law gives birth to a daughter very often the mother-in-law will blame the daughter-in-law why did you give birth to a daughter you should have given birth to a son whether it's a son or a daughter male or a female it's in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but today science as well as the Quran says it is the male which is responsible for deciphering the sex of the child and not the female so if the mother-in-law has to blame someone she should blame the son she should not blame the daughter-in-law Furthermore, the Quran says in Surah Zumar, chapter number 39, verse number 6, that we have created the human beings in stages in womb of the mother, one after the other, in three veils of darkness. Prophet Keith Moore said, these three veils of darkness refers to the anterior abdominal wall, it refers to the amniocoronic membrane and the uterine wall. And the Quran says in Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 2, we have given the human being the faculty of hearing and sight. Today science tells us the first sense to develop is the sense of hearing. But the five and a half month of pregnancy, the ear, the ear splits open. And later on the eye splits open at seventh month. So first sense to develop is the sense of hearing, then the sense of sight. There was an experiment done many years back at the days where there were manual typewriters. There was a child, a newborn child taken, who was a newborn child whose mother was a typist using a manual typewriter and other nine children were taken for normal mothers and all the ten newborns were placed together and the typewriter was sounded. All of them got scared except the child whose mother was a typist because he was used to hearing the sign you hearing the sound of the typewriter in the womb of the mother that's the reason it's mentioned in the hadith that when a woman is pregnant she to recite the Quran it's helpful for the newborn child and today science tells us that the pregnant woman should not see horror movies etc she should be careful it will affect the child the first comes the sense of hearing then the sign due to limitation of time I'll just mention two more scientific facts before I end the lecture it is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Qiyamah chapter number 75 verse number 3 to 4 that when they ask 
how will almighty god be able to reconstruct our bones after we have been buried the bones have got disintegrated how will he be able to reconstruct our bones on the day of judgment so the quran replies tell them he will not only be able to reconstruct the bones he can reconstruct in very perfect order the very tips of the finger what does the quran mean by saying he can not only reconstruct the bone but reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger it was in 1880 that sir francis gold discovered the fingerprinting method and said that no two fingerprints even in a million people are identical today the cia the cid the fbi they use the fingerprinting method in identifying the culprit imagine quran mentioned 14 years ago that almighty god can not only reconstruct the bones he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger i would like to mention the last scientific fact so prophet takarudakashan who hailed from thailand he did a great deal of research on pain he did research on pain receptors and today Today the doctors they tell us previously we thought only the brain was responsible for feeling of pain after science advanced we have come to know there are certain receptors in the skins which are also responsible for feeling of the pain which today we call as pain receptors that is the reason if a patient of burn injury comes the doctor takes a pin and pricks it in the area of burn if the patient feels pain the doctor is happy it's a superficial burn the pain receptors are intact if the patient does not feel pain the doctor is sad it's a deep burn the pain receptors have been destroyed when prophet Dagashan was approached he was given the translation of verse of the quran of surah nisa chapter number four verse number 56 which says as to those who reject our signs we shall cast them in the hellfire and as often as the skins are roasted we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain the quran says as often as the skins are roasted we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain indicating there is something in the skin which is responsible for the feeling of pain when prophet Akhashan was shown the verse of the quran he said how could a book 1400 years ago talk about pain receptors which we discovered recently later on checking with prophet keith moore and other scientists he was so impressed that in the ninth medical conference in riyadh he said the shahada la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah there is no god but allah and prophet muhammad is the messenger of allah <laughs> now coming back to the atheist after every scientific fact you ask him who could have mentioned in the quran the only reply the atheist can give you is the answer he gave you the first time the creator the manufacturer the inventor the producer the maker this creator this manufacturer this inventor this producer this maker we muslims call as allah so this book the glorious quran which came into existence 14 years ago could not have been revealed by anyone except the creator of the human beings of the universe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a very famous scientist by the name of Albert Einstein he said that science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind let me remind you that the glorious quran is not a book of science s c i e n c e but it's a book of signs s i g n s and there are more than 6000 signs 6000 ayats in the glorious quran out of which more than a thousand speak about science Many people may ask me, the brother Zakir, you are using science to prove the Quran? Is the word of God? I say, no, no, no. I am taking the yardstick of the non Muslims, of the atheists, and comparing with my yardstick, the Golis Quran. Yardstick means something which is superior. 
for me number one is the quran not science i am comparing their yashtik the science with my yashtik the quran and proving my yashtik the quran is far superior than your yashtik science i am not using science to prove the quran right i am using their yashtik and comparing with my yashtik and when you are comparing science with quran be careful only talk about scientific facts don't talk about scientific theories and hypotheses because many a times these theories and hypotheses they take you turn that's the reason francis bacon a very famous philosopher said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist in depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in god that's the reason today science is not eliminating god it is eliminating models of god la ilaha illallah science today is not eliminating god it is eliminating models of god this cannot be god this cannot be god this cannot be god except allah la ilaha illallah i would like to end my talk with the verse i started my talk with of surah fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 53 where allah says in the quran sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana law anna lak awalam yakhfi bi rabbika anna wa kulli shay'in shaheed soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest reaches of the horizons and into the soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Thank you very much Dr Zakir Naik. Tuan-tuan dan puan-puan yang dirahmati Allah sekalian, kita berikan sekali lagi tepukan kepada Dr Zakir Naik. As the time given is very limited, we may begin with the Q&A session. I believe that we have volunteers to assist Dr Zakir Naik. How many microphone ports available? Uh, can anybody assist me? Microphone port. We supposed to have how many? We supposed to have four microphone port. So I will provide few guidelines, and insha Allah, Dr. Zaki Naid will add. Number one. I would like to invite the non-Muslims audience to come forward, and the non-Muslim will be given a priority to ask question to Dr. Zakir Naik. That's the first thing. Second, since we have four microphone ports, so the thing that we are going to do is that each question. will be allowed for each microphone port i repeat each question will be allowed for each microphone port and it will be conducted in the clockwise rotation so i will hand over to you dr zaki Alhamdulillah we come to the second part of the session which is the question answer session which is more interesting than the first part with the monologue the second part is more of a dialogue and as was mentioned earlier that we prefer to give first opportunity to non muslims if there any non muslims over here in the audience they would be given the first preference to ask a question for the non muslims they can ask any questions on islam and comparative religion whether it be islam whether it be christianity whether it be hinduism this is the opportunity normally after religious talks you don't have open question answer session i always prefer so that there is a dialogue you can ask any question on islam you can criticize islam you can attack the quran if you want this is the opportunity i'm young i can take it after the non muslims have exhausted will you opportunity to the muslims to ask the question please 
before asking your question, mention your name and your profession. Please ask one question at a time. Your question, if it's more than one, please go beyond the queue, behind the queue, and wait for your opportunity. Please keep your questions brief, two or three sentences. If it is more than two or three sentences, it's a short speech. Speech time is over. So ask your question in two or three sentences. And for the Muslims, please restrict your questions to the topic, does God exist? For the non-Muslims, they can ask any questions on the topic, outside the topic, on Islam, on comparative religion. This is a prerogative. I believe there are four microphones, one for the gent on my left. There are three microphones, two for the gents, one on my left, one on my right, and one for the ladies on my extreme right. Those who would like to ask a question, I request them to please make a queue behind the microphone. Those who come first would be given the first opportunity. If there are any, mashallah, there are many brothers on my left microphone, I would want even brothers on the right side should make a queue. And the sisters on my right, they can make a queue on the extreme right microphone. We will start with the ladies first and then go in a clockwise manner. Then my gent on my left, then gent on my right. Are there any non-Muslims on any other microphones? If there are any non-Muslims, we would like to give them the first opportunity. If not, we can start with the sisters. Can the sister ask the first question? Brother, can you put the microphone more behind? Brother, let not the microphone cover the pillar. So hell, either keep the microphone behind or in the front. Get in the front, yes. So we'll get the microphone in the front. Can we have the first question from the sister side? Yes, sister, most welcome. Okay, assalamu alaikum and a very good evening to all. I'm Nadia Najib and I work as a sound planner. This is a question for my dearest friend who is a non Muslim. His name is Mahesh Kumar and he's a Hindu. And he's one of your biggest fans and most ardent supporters that I have known. And he has these one simple questions. Um, I'm, st uh, I'm sure that you are aware there has been a fierce debate and ongoing discussions about how similar Hindu and Islam is. And there are several claims to the extent that say how Kaaba are actually derived from the word Kabbalishwara temple, which means that the part where Shiva uh, put his crescent moon on his head. And there are certain uh, similarities between how... Sister, can you pose the question a bit slowly? Oh, if you okay. can, slowly and clearly. Please, sister. All right. Sorry. The first part I heard about our friend Mahesh but when you start keeping over the temple, I did not understand. Okay. Um, Mahesh is a Hindu and he's a dearest person to me because we're very close. And he's one of your ardent supporter, and he even looked like you a bit. Um, and he has these questions about the ongoing debate, which is fiercely done by the internet. There are several writings saying how similar Hindu and Islam is. And uh, those claims, I mean, partly of the claims are saying that how um, the Kaaba are derived from the word Kabbalishwara, meaning the temple, which is especially, uh, specifically for Shiva, at the moment when he put uh, the crescent moon on his forehead. And there are even some claims they saying how similar our pilgrims of Hajj and Umrah look to Holy Pandit of Hindu. And there are also um, some claims saying that King Vikramaditya inscription on golden disc were hung in the Kaaba, and many, many more claims saying that some of them are, uh, such as the word 786, which is all over Quran, are actually a mirror of Om in, Hindu, in Sanskrit. <coughs> the sister asked a very good question, that one of a friend by the name of Mahesh, he's a fan of mine, and he asked that there are many similarities between Islam and Hinduism going on on the internet, and she gave a few examples regarding Kaaba being a Kamleshwar temple, and talking it's belong to Shiva or the way the Hajj is done, the rites 
of the Hindus and uh, even the King Vikramaditya, something hanging in Kaaba. Uh, Dr. Saki, and one more, you say that the celebrations of Kaaba, the seven signs are similar to those um, um, practiced in temples. First, you should realize, sister, if you have to understand any religion, don't look at the followers, look at the scriptures. If I have to understand Islam, don't look at the Muslims, understand the Quran and the authentic Hadith, which are the scriptures of Islam. Similarly, if I have to understand Hinduism, I don't have to look at the Hindus, I have to understand the scriptures. The Hindu scriptures have been divided into two types, the Shruti and the Smriti. The Shruti is the word of God. In Shruti, you have the Vedas and the Upanishads. In the Smriti, you have the Puranas, you have the Etihas, you have the Ramayana, you have the Mahabharata, you have the Bhagavad Gita. The most superior books are the Shrutis, Vedas and the Puranas. I know there are many books written by similarities between Islam and Hinduism, including by Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. And many things what you said, some of them are there in this book. That Kaaba is shivling and Kaaba is this. Not yes, it is no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Where now you see in none of the Hindu scripture ever does it say that Kaaba is shivling. I want proof. It is his thinking. When you talk similarities, quote chapter number, verse number. And that's what I do. When I give a lecture, I quote Veda chapter number so and so, verse number so and so. If I talk about concept of God, I'll give you references. Not what Mahesh is following or what Ganesh is following or what anyone is following. We have to quote the scriptures. So when we compare about similarities, many a times they are comparing things which are not there in Islam. If some Muslim is doing some wrong practice and someone copies and says even Hindus do that, that does not mean Islam is saying that. And there are some Muslims who do wrong practice, they think it is Islamic, it's not Islamic. So for comparing two religions, you have to compare the scripture sister. There are many similarities. I don't know of any place in the Quran mentioned that Kaaba is of Shiva. No one in any of the Hindu scriptures, any of the Shruti, whether Veda or Purana, that it is Shivling. Some say it is Shivling, some like Kamleshwar temple. These are all hypotheses. And when I had a debate with Shri Shri Ravi Shankar, he said, you know, I wrote this book very fast, in two hours. Who told you to write the book in two hours? See, I give reply in two minutes, less than two minutes, correct? Just because I give the reply immediately in two minutes, that does not justify that I can make a mistake. Such a great personality, such a big following. You write a book and many of the things are wrong. It's not part of Islam at all. Similarly, sister, there is no proof of what you have said. Yes, regarding Hajj and the Tirth. Yes, the Kaaba is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. If you read Rigved, book number 10, it says the place for worship is the place where Narashansa was born. Narashansa is, Nar means man, Shansa means praiseworthy, praiseworthy. In Arabic, it is Muhammad sallallahu So it says the place of Tirth. The place of pilgrimage is the place where Narashansa was born, where Prophet Muhammad was born. Yes, it does say. But doesn't say shivling is Kaaba. It doesn't say that. There are places. I have given a full talk. For example, if I want to compare the concept of God in Islam and Hinduism, I say that most of the Hindus, if you ask a common Hindu, how many gods does he believe in? Some will say three, some will say ten, some will say thousand, some will say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million. But if you ask a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures that how many gods should the Hindus believe in, he will say one god. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. The common Hindu believes that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims believe is everything is God's. G-O-D with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God. The sun belongs to God. The moon belongs to God. The human being belongs to God. The snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindu and the Muslim is the common Hindu says everything is God. We Muslims say everything is God's. 
G O D with an apostrophe S. The major difference is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do you do it? Come to common terms as been us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Now, when we read the Hindu scriptures, when we read the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one, it says, Ekkam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which says, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sita Sita Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Na kasya kasij, janita na chadipa. It's a Sanskrit quotation which says, Almighty God has got no Lord, has got no mother, no father. It's mentioned in Sveta Setara Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. Na tasya pratima asti. Of that God, there is no pratima. Pratima in Sanskrit means an image. Pratima means a picture, a portrait, a photograph. A sculpture, an idol. Na tasipatima asti of that God. There is no pratima. There is no image. There is no picture. There is no painting. There is no portrait. There is no idol. There is no sculpture. Who says that? Sita Sita Upanishad, chapter number four, number nineteen. Further, if you read amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred, the the most widely read. Is the Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 21. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods, they worship false gods. And the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures are the Vedas. If you read the Veda, it's mentioned in Yajurved. It's mentioned in Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na asti. Of that God, there is no image, there is no photograph, there is no painting, there is no picture, there is no idol, there is no sculpture. It's mentioned in Yajurvei chapter number 40 verse number 8 that Almighty God is pure and doesn't have an image, imageless. It's mentioned in Yajurvei chapter number 40 verse number 9 Andhatma Pavishanti Ya Asambhuti Mupaste They are entering darkness those who worship the Sambhuti that is the natural things like water, air, fire and the verse continues they are entering more in darkness those who worship the asambhuti the created thing like table chair idol etc who says that yajurved chapter number 40 verse number 9 and the brahma sutra of hinduism is ekam braham dyutya naste nena naste kinchan bhagwan ek hi hai dusra nahi hai nahi hai nahi hai zara bhi nahi hai there is only one god not a second one not at all not at all not in the least bit now i am quoting with reference and believe me, there are many Hindus who love me. They respect me. They even come, come and touch my feet. I say, it is shirk. They say, I, we, have, no, we have seen avatar of God. Shirk, haram. Because I quote, I have not seen any, any Hindu speaker quoting like that. I am a student of compared religion. I am not a scholar. So they come and they touch my feet. I say, haram, shirk. But those who are fanatic, they don't like it. And they say Zakir is bringing discord. Now, am I being discord? I am trying to get the Muslims and Hindus together by removing the apostrophe yes. And how do I remove the how do I remove the apostrophe yes? Quoting the scriptures. Have I criticized any one point? But I speak on a scholarly level with proof. So when you get similarities, sister, get similarities between the scriptures. Not hypothesis. But hypothesis will create problems. If you say something, it will hurt the sentiments. I am quoting the scripture. That's a different thing that most of the Hindus do not know the scriptures. So when they come to know, many a time the Hindus said, we have sat for your lecture and question and session for three years. In my 40 years, what I did not learn, I learned in three hours of your lecture and question and session. Alhamdulillah. And many of the Hindus respect me. They love me. But some who are fanatic, they don't like. Why? Because if Hindus and Muslims get together, then both loki dukan bandho jayenge. They will shop, the shop will close down. You know, you know shop. Some people have made shops to sell. So we are here to bring peace between the different religions. Whether it be Christianity, that's what the Quran says. Talo ila kalimatin sawa im baina baina kum. Now ask your friend Mahesh to see my talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. 
it does not speak anything against Hinduism but speaks about the similarities which many things which the Hindus aren't aware and even Muslim aren't aware. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes. Most welcome. Can we have the next question? Um, uh, very good morning, sir. My name is... Hey, uh, very good afternoon. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Carlos. Carlos and I am a Christian. So my question is, uh, in Christian, we have uh, Old Testament and New Testament uh, Bible. And which one should I read and should I uh, trust more? <clears throat> the brother asked a very good question. He's a Christian and he says there is Old Testament, there is New Testament. Which should he trust? Brother, there is Old Testament, there is New Testament. There is also something called as the Last Testament. Last Testament, Quran. Who is saying that? Not Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir Naik in Islam is zero. Who says that? Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If you read the New Testament, as a Christian, according to your church, you have to follow both. Only following, if you read the Bible, Bible is divided into two parts, the Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament talks about stories of the prophets right from Adam, peace be upon him, till before Jesus, peace be upon him. New Testament talks about the life of Jesus, peace be upon him, onwards the but a christian if he does not follow the old testament he will not be able to follow the new testament because only if he believes the new test old testament will he agree with the prophecies of jesus christ coming so as a christian according to the church you should follow old testament and new testament now when you follow old and the new testament in the new testament jesus christ peace be upon himself says in the gospel of john chapter number 16 verse number 12 to 14 jesus christ peace be upon him says i have many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them now for he when the spirit of truth shall come he shall show you things to come he shall glorify me he shall not speak of himself all that year shall he speak he shall glorify me this is prophet jesus peace be upon him talking to his people i have many things to say unto you but you cannot understand them now this is about 2000 years back for he when the spirit of truth shall come he shall guide you unto all truth he shall not speak of himself all that year shall he speak he shall glorify me this prophecy is about no one but coming of the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him it is not about Holy Spirit. It is about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 7 says, it is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter shall not come. For if I depart, shall he come. Many Christians say this is Holy Spirit. If you read this prophecy, the criteria for the Holy Spirit, for, uh, for the Comfort to come, is that Jesus Christ peace be upon should depart. If you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit was already there before Jesus Christ peace be upon him was born in the womb of the Elizabeth. He was there when Jesus was born. He was there at the, at the feast of Pentecost. So surely this prophecy doesn't refer to the Holy Spirit but refers to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is prophesied in several places in the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 18 verse number 18. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 18 verse number 19. In the book of Isaiah chapter number 29 verse number 12. In the Song of Solomon chapter number 5 verse number 16. He's even prophesied in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John chapter number 14 verse number 16. In the Gospel of John chapter number 15 verse number 26. In the Gospel of John chapter number 16 verse number 7. As well as the Gospel of John chapter number 16 verse 12 to 14. All these are references. I'm not pulling a fast one. You can go home and check. And all these prophecies are talking about a new messenger to come. The last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So if you ask me, should you follow Old Testament or New Testament? I, should, I will tell you, follow the last testament. That is the Quran. And who has said that? Old Testament is saying that. I gave you references. New Testament is saying that. I gave you references. Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, is saying so if you're a good Christian, if you're a good follower of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is compulsory you should believe in Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you do not, that means you're not a good Christian. Brother, are you a good Christian? Yes or no? 
Brother, are you a good Christian? You don't know. Are you a good Christian or not? Yes. That means you have to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Peace be upon him. If Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. Brother, do you believe Jesus is a prophet of God or is God? Jesus is a prophet. MashaAllah, that means you're good. Even we believe Jesus is a prophet of God. Because Islam is the only non Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims are going together. But the difference is that most of the Christians, unlike you, Mashallah, you are a good Christian. Unlike you, they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement from the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, or where he says, worship me. If you point out a single unequivocal statement from anywhere in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God, or where he says, worship me, I am ready to accept Christianity. In fact, if you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my father. Anyone who says I seek not my will with the will of Almighty God is a Muslim. Jesus Christ, peace be upon you, was a Muslim. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. That means Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, peace be upon him, was a prophet of God. Unfortunately, the church teaches the Christian that he's God. But nowhere it is mentioned in the Bible that is God. Even in the Quran, it says that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. Good brother. Brother, you believe that Jesus is God, alhamdulillah. Do you believe that there is one God? Yes. MashaAllah. Do you believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? Yes. You believe that? Yeah. Very good. There are minimum two criteria required for any human being to enter the fold of Islam. If any human being wants to become a Muslim, there are minimum two things required. One is he should believe there is one God. And I gave the definition of God in my lecture. You should not believe Jesus is God. And you should believe that besides Jesus being a messenger of God, Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God. So if you believe there is one God, and if you believe Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God, that means according to me you are a Muslim. To be a Muslim, you have to agree in the other things will follow later on. About following, about praying will come later on. But first you have to take admission into the school. First you join nursery, then you can do first standard, second standard, third standard, tenth standard. So to take admission in the fold of Islam, you have to believe in two things. Believe that there is one God and believe that Prophet Muhammad is a messenger of God. And you, and you agree with both. Would you like to say it in Arabic? Would you like to say that in Arabic, that there is one God and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God? If you believe in these two things, that there is one God, okay. and you believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, that means you are submitting your will to God. And a person who submits his will to God is called as a Muslim. Muslim doesn't mean having a name Zakir, Abdullah, Sultan, or Muhammad. Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. If he agrees there is one God, and if he agrees Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, these are the minimum two things required for a human being to become a Muslim. Later on, he will learn more and get more knowledge. But minimum these two things, if he agrees, he becomes a Muslim. 
Would you like to enter the fold of Islam? Would you like to say it in Arabic? Same thing that there is one God and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. Would you like to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, please be upon you? But if I, I entered uh, and convert to Muslim, I must learn about Muslim, right? Yes. When you convert, once you become a Muslim, you have set the minimum two requirement. Then later on would come Salah, not from day one. And then, because we believe this life is a test for the hereafter. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, I have many things to send to you, but you cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu will come, he will guide you to truth. So, once you enter, slowly, slowly you learn, and you practice. How you enter school, first you learn A, B, C, D, then C, A, T, cat, B, A, T, bat. Slowly, slowly, it takes time. Some people get double promotion, they learn fast also. Would you like to enter the school of Islam? We are thinking too much. <laughs> I'm not ready, sir. Okay, fine. I would like you to do more study. Yeah. And once you're convinced, I would like you to enter the fold of Islam. To enter the fold of Islam, as I told you, minimum two things are required. Believe that there is one God and believe Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God. Later on the practice comes. But as a good Christian, you have to follow the advice of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Inshallah, I'll pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you guidance as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Then we have the next question, brother. Are there any other non-Muslims like to ask a question? Any non-Muslim from the sister's side or from the brother's side would like to ask a question? Any non-Muslims? You can ask any questions. It's your opportunity. By the time you're coming on the microphone, we'll take a question from the brother's side. Yes, brother, on my right. Assalamu alaikum, uh, brother Dr. Zakir. My name is Zakaria Jusu. I'm a businessman. I... Uh, Ask this question because I couldn't answer to my good friend of mine who was studying together with me in the States and he was Murta. He asked this question before, back 25 years ago to me, but I could not reply to him. The main reason he converted, I mean, he went Murta because he is questioning the justice of Allah. He said, Why certain people are born none with, without shahada? Some people are born with shahada, and the hidayah is only from the God, from Allah. He questioned that justice, why certain people are good in humanity, but born without shahada. Thank you, brother. Brother said that you had a friend 25 years back in states for the Muslim. He asked you a simple question. You could not reply, and he became a murtad. Inshallah, don't let it happen again. It happened 25 years back. Yes. After I give the answer, if you don't repeat the answer, then you're in trouble. Okay? okay? I wish you would have asked this question 25 years back. Yes, I, I wish. Yeah, yeah. The question posed is that his friend, who's a Muslim, questioned the injustice of Allah, knows Billah, that why some people are born with Shada, some without Shada, that means some people are born Muslim, some people are non-Muslim. Why this injustice? Brother, according to a Prophet Muhammad every child is born in Deen al-Fitr. Every child is born as a Muslim. You don't have to give shahada. To become a Muslim, you have to submit your will to God. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, every child when he is born, he submits his will to God. Irrespective whether he is born in a Christian family, Jewish family, Hindu family, Muslim family, he is born as a Muslim. Later on, he is influenced by his parents, by his teachers, by his elders, by his friends, he may start doing fire worship, he may start doing idol worship, and he converts. Oh. Some of them, they have got good influence of their parents, they remain as Muslims. That the reason when a non-Muslim becomes a Muslim, convert is a wrong word. The correct word is revert. He was a Muslim, 
he became a non-Muslim. He deviated. Then he came back to Islam. So the more appropriate word is revert, not convert. Now regarding a question. Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala injust? Billah, that some are born in a Muslim family, so they remain Muslims. Some people are born in non-Muslim families, therefore they become non-Muslim. Can be the question. Question is a little bit changed. What you have to realize is that everyone born in a Muslim family will not go to Jannah. And everyone born in a non-Muslim family will not go to Jannah. Best example is your friend. Was a Muslim, became a Murtad. Will he go to Jannah? No. That proves that everyone born in a Muslim family will not go to Jannah. The requirement for Jannah is given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal as innal insala fi khus illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa bil sabr. The by the token of time, man is very in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. These are the minimum four criteria required for any human being go to Jannah. Many people have a misconception that if I'm born in a Muslim family, and if I call myself Muslim, I'll go to Jannah. This is a misconception. Big misconception. To go to Jannah, all four things are required. Iman, righteous deed, watawa bil haq, dawa, and watawa bil sabr. Inviting people to patience and perseverance. So it's not necessary that everyone born in a Muslim family goes to Jannah. He may become a murtad like your friend. He may say he's a Muslim, but will rob, will do zina, will drink alcohol, will cheat. If Allah forgives him, he'll go to Jannah. Allah doesn't forgive him, he'll go to Jannah. There are many people born in a non-Muslim family. And mashallah, many people accepting Islam through Peace TV. Mashallah, every day hundreds, Alhamdulillah. Every day, Alhamdulillah, Allah is giving them Hidayah. Born in a non-Muslim family. They hear the lectures, they accept it. So it's not sure, Allah, is not, Allah gives everyone an opportunity. And the verse I quoted in the ending of my talk, I started the talk with, gave the translation in the end. Of Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 53. If someone says, maybe I didn't get the message of Islam. What? Maybe he didn't get the message of Islam. Why should he go to Jahannam? Correct? There were two tribes. The Kapauku tribe and the Austin Aborigines. These two tribes did not come in contact with modern civilization till as late as 1950. When researchers went and tried to find out what was their way of life, it was everything of Islam but in name. They believe in one God. They believe God has got no image, God has got no idols, they did the sajda, they prostrated for worshipping that God. Everything same, not in name. So if you take a child born in a Christian family or from a Hindu family and you isolate them completely, they will continue on Deen al fitra They will behave like Muslims. Because of the external influence, they change. Now Allah says in the Quran, irrespective whether someone gives you dawah or not, whether you're born in Timbuktu or an island, Allah says that He will give the message directly to every human being. Allah says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 53, Sanuri him ayatina filafaki, wa fi anfusi him, hatta yatabayyana law anna ulhaq, avalam yakfi bi rabbika, anna ala kulle shayin shaheed, that soon, soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. So Allah says, irrespective if someone gives you the message or not, to every human being, whether born in Muslim family or non-Muslim family, Allah himself gives the message in his heart. But when a person gets a message, he may not follow. If I follow, then I lose my business. If I follow, I will not have to drink alcohol. I cannot go dancing with girls and I cannot do this. I cannot gamble. So he doesn't follow. Therefore, on the day of judgment, Allah says in the Quran that the unbelievers will never question to the justice of Allah. They will only say, give us one more chance. Allah will say, it's too late. Allah gives you chance in this world. Hundred times, thousand times, ten thousand times. Once you die, test is over. So tell your friend that Allah will give to every human being the message. But every human being will not follow it because of his personal desires. Allah says that in the Quran. So therefore, no unbeliever on the day of judgment will ever, including your friend, cannot tell that Allah is unjust because Allah makes it clear to every human being, Anna ul-haq, 
This is the truth. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. The most welcome. Then we have the next question. Are there any non-Muslims who would like to ask a question? Any non-Muslim sisters? Any non-Muslim brothers? Questions on Quran, questions on Islam, questions on comparative religion. Yes, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Aslina and I am a writer. As you know, your presence in Malaysia got so many responses from the citizen, whether in negative or positive way. Some might be very happy uh, with, uh, when you come here uh, and some of them against you. Okay, it might be one of uh, your challenges as uh, precious. So what do you think about these situations? And one more thing, yesterday uh, the Malaysian authorities um, have to decide to stop your talk in Melaka, but today they changed to allow you again with uh, one condition that you need to uh, change your topic. So what do you feel about this? This is a question that I've got many fans here, I've got people who are against me, and people, some people are happy, some people don't like, it's difficult for a preacher to die. And I was going to give a talk in KL and Malacca and it was cancelled in the yesterday newspaper headline. Controversy Dr. Zakir Naik cancelled. And then again today, it has come back. First of all, I would like to thank Hindraf. You know Hindraf? It's a Hindu organization. I would like to thank them for giving me free publicity. I have not come here for publicity, I have to thank them because now I expect a bigger audience will come in Kale and in Malacca. Point number one. Point number one, thank them. That's a different thing that what they said is not true. And there are many people who told them, why don't you come? We will make you sit in the front row and we will allow you to ask the first question. You can ask Dr. Zai. That's what I believe. If I'm someone who is speaking falsehood, I will never allow question answer session. I like challenge. If I am wrong, I will say I am wrong. So first I would like to thank them for giving me free publicity for, so that more people will come there. And they even said that, I know they send circulars everywhere that no Hindu should attend. But I was there yesterday at the university. At the university. Mashallah, there was a lady who came and she asked questions. How many Hindus came, I don't know. But Hindus even came and asked me questions. Alhamdulillah. The second thing I'd like to thank them for is getting the Muslims together. You know, I gave a talk. My first public lecture in Terangana was a topic chosen by the Honorable Chief Minister of Terangana, his topic, that the importance of the unity in the Muslim Ummah. And I gave a talk. And we know that unfortunately Muslim Ummah is divided. But sometimes what happened? When the enemy comes, it unites the Muslims. When this Hindraf and MIC said, you know, and they made a statement, they made a statement that, you know, one of the deputy chief minister of Penang told Satan, Dr. Zakir Naik. MashaAllah, all the Muslims, it angered the Muslims. I'm happy. MashaAllah. So I am thankful to the deputy chief minister of Penang to unite the Muslims so much so that not only the ruling party, even the opposition, the ruling party, I'm no, objected to it. The opposition, I don't know all the name, pass or whichever, I'm not a political person. All the opposition came and they said, how dare you attack the Muslims and Islam. So I'd like to thank Hindraf and MIC and the deputy CM of Penang for getting the Muslims united, even the political party. To unite Muslims is difficult. I gave a talk. So at least one thing, Alhamdulillah, because he attacked Islam and he attacked the die of Islam, we may have differences. I know some Muslims may not like me. Some Muslims may be my fan. But we should be united. We agree to disagree. We agree to disagree. For me, if someone abuses me, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. I would like to thank that at least he united the Muslims. To unite the Muslims is difficult. So at least you could see on the headline and today's paper I saw the headline, you know, I'm no party giving statement that we let, we'll make it have, we'll see to it that Dr. Zaki's program take place. The opposition is saying we'll see to it, we'll, we'll have Dr. Zaki next program and it's good. So what I believe, if 
I could unite the Muslims, even a small fraction. I would like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as the allegation, it is not correct for the Muslims to abuse or criticize any God. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, revile not those, abuse not those who they worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means the Muslim is not allowed to criticize even the wrong gods which they worship. That is Quran. And never have I criticized any of the gods. The problem is that when I speak, many people agree with me. And when they agree, many people accept Islam. We find in India, we find in Dubai, in many parts of the world, they're accepting Islam. No one is forcing them. So what we find that some of them who are fanatic and don't know their religion well, if they know their religion well, you tell me one thing, anyone points out any verse of the Quran which I'm not following, and he points out to me, I will thank him. You say, Dr. Zakir, chapter number so and so, verse number so and so, you're not following. I'll say, Jadakallah. I think I'm following most of the verses. I'm a human being, I can make a mistake. If I make a mistake, and if I realize, okay, I made a mistake, the person who points out my mistake, I have to thank him. It is egoistic not to agree with a mistake. It is human to her. And even I can make a mistake. That is the reason I say, let's have question and succession. If I make a mistake, I will change. So as a dai, a dai should be versatile. He should be kind. When required, he should be like Sheikh Didas, roaring like a lion when required, when you're having a debate, etc. And what we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that may Allah accept our efforts. May Allah accept our effort. And I believe that every time I'm coming to Malaysia, the audience is increasing. And the audience is increasing, and I find that the love is increasing. And I really appreciate, you know, first I came in 1996. And in the last about 20 years, I've come six times, or last 21 years, six times. So maybe every three and a half years I've come on average. Now the love has increased, so maybe I'll have to come more often than every three and a half years, inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Zakanik, for a beautiful speech and also a lot of scientific evidence about science and Islam. I would like to touch about medicine and Islam. Okay, my name is Dr. Afik. I'm a medical doctor. Pardon me. Can I repeat the last sentence you'd like to touch on? Medicine and Islam. Medicine. Yeah. Medicine. Yeah. What is medicine? Medicine. Medicine, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, it's my okay. issue. Medicine, Medicine and Islam. And Islam. Yes, okay. Sir. As I were to quote from your speech, religion without science is blind. Okay. Allah is the only healer and no human can heal any disease without his permission. However, some people in Malaysia believe that only by praying without seeing medical treatment or seek any medical attention, they can get a cure. Some say the current medical practice is far from Islamic way. And they also claim that Western agenda has tried to weaken our Muslim society from the health perspective. For example, I would like to give when a patient in end-stage renal failure okay, was suggested for dialysis, he or she might refuse the treatment because he believed that Allah, Allah can heal him or her. At the same time, he also doesn't want or afraid that he might be the victim of the Western agenda. So the question is, as a Muslim, are we allowed to choose a risky decision for our health of life, although they are clinical and also evidence-based solution to preserve and protect it? Thank you. Brother asked a very good question. He asked a question on medicine and Islam, and he said there are some Muslims who believe that it is Allah who heals, and even I believe Allah is the only one who heals, and Allah says, Huwa Shafi, He is the only one who heals. 
but you have to follow his guidance very important there are some muslim who believe that only allah's healing is sufficient we don't have to go to a doctor they have one said other people who believe only medical doctors are sufficient taking allopathy is sufficient we allah says in the quran in surah nisa chapter 4 verse 171 la taglu fi dinukum do not commit excess in your religion this is excessive yes if someone says that i will read the verse of the quran and can be cured yes it's possible quran is ruqya allah says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 8182 it says wa qul ja la qazaq al batil inna al batil qana zuka wa nunzil al quran ala wa shifa wa rahmatul alamin wa la yazil zalimin illa khasara that when truth is all again falsehood falsehood perishes but falsehood is by its nature bound to perish quran is a healing for the believers and for the others it is nothing but loss so what we have to realize unfortunately we have muslims going on extreme they say anything western haram some say anything western great so we have been so much impressed with western world that we head over heels and some people are so much against that khalas everything haram what we have to do is a balance we are ummat e wast now what you have to realize allah says in the quran yes number one to heal is allah but if you have to believe in allah you have to follow allah allah says in the quran in surah nahl chapter 16 verse 43 and surah anbiya chapter 21 verse number 7 fasalu ahl zikri in kuntum la ta'lamu if you don't know all the person who knowledgeable so if you are sick allah says go to a doctor if you don't go to a doctor you are not following allah fine you can even go to ruqya you can go to a raqi also no problem go to a raqi he may cure you no problem but that doesn't mean only go to raqi so if you are sick quran doesn't say go to a muslim doctor yes you find a muslim good if you find a non muslim no problem so if you don't know as that means quran is telling if you are sick you go to a doctor if you have knowledge you go to a teacher so going to the doctor is compulsory if you say i will not go to a doctor it is wrong it is wrong you have to go yes if he is telling you to do something haram and you don't follow that is different but most of the doctor don't tell you to haram if he tell you renal dialysis it's allowed quran says in surah bakara chapter 2 verse 173 surah maida chapter 5 verse number 3 in surah anam chapter 6 verse 145 and surah nahl chapter 16 verse number 115 hurramat alaikumul maytu tawaddamu wal amul kinzir wama uhilla li ghayr allah bi forbidden for you for food are dead meat blood flesh of swine and any food on which any name it says allah's name is taken but if you unwillingly disobey allah allah is rahman rahim means if you are in a boat and you are dying of hunger and if only pork is there to save your life you can eat pork also normally pork is haram but if you are on a boat and you have no food supply your boat is in the sea for days together once you come on shore again pork becomes haram hello if you know that alcohol is the only drug that can save you alcohol is haram yes don't have alcohol in cough syrup you know some people want to have beer because they are feeling cold that is haram if you are feeling cold have honey honey keeps you more warm than the beer but you don't get the kick in the honey what you get in the beer So in Islam we have to take Quran as a whole. So if you are sick, it's compulsory you should go to a doctor. If you don't have money to go and you don't go, then Allah will forgive you. But if you say no, it is wrong. That is what Allah is saying. So you have to understand Islam as a whole, not just in parts. So Quran says, go to an expert. If you are sick, you have to go. If you know, if there is some treatment. which is the only treatment that can save your life even if it's haram it becomes permissible but if it's a treatment which is not a major treatment like cough syrup and if you have alcohol it is wrong because that's a small thing you can have other drugs which is non alcoholic which can yet cure your problem hope that answers the question thank you the most welcome then we have the next question okay. assalam alaikum dr zakir nai wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it's very nice to meet you Okay, my name is Sadiq Fauzan bin Muhammad Fauzi, and I'm a student. Uh, my question is a simple question. Uh, you have uh, I watch uh, a few videos of yours, and you say that uh, the Allah Allah sent one thousand and twenty four hundred prophet 
uh, in the world and uh, mentioned in the Quran is 25 names uh, so my question is uh, why on, only uh, the followers of Jesus Christ peace be upon him has misunderstood uh, the uh, misunderstood he is the God uh, but the, the other prophets such as the followers of the Moses did not misunderstood the followers of the prophet Muhammad did not understood which he was God Yes, so, the brother asked a question that I mentioned in my lecture that there were 124,000, not 2400, 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. It's a Sahih Hadith mentioned in Mishkat al-Masabi, and but 25 are mentioned by name. And I also said that the only messengers whose followers misunderstood him to be God are the followers of Jesus. Why? They misunderstood. You have to ask them why they misunderstood. Why are you asking me? Now, because he was misunderstood, that's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive. They misunderstood that he claimed divinity. Most of the Christians today believe that Jesus is God. Because of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 158, Allah raised him up alive. So in his second coming, he will testify. He never told them to worship him. But he said, oh, Budullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, my Lord and your Lord. So Allah has raised him up alive so that in his second coming, he will testify to the Christians. He never claimed divinity, but you are the messenger of God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sister. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, 12 years ago, I was asked uh, by my daughter, uh, Ma, where can I meet Allah? Uh, so uh, I asked her back, um, why you want to meet him? Uh, she said, um, um, I want to ask him uh, to give you the ability uh, to pregnant, to get pregnant. Because um, uh, you see, uh, if, we want, if, if we want to give birth, we see doctor. Uh, then, uh, so that I want to ask Allah to give you the ability to pregnant so that you can see doctor after that to give birth. So, um, I was clueless at that time. Uh, I also asked um, many ustaz, um, but I got um, um, answer that was not kids friendly. So, I would like to ask your help, uh, though it might seem too late. Uh, to give me the answer that uh, the answer to my daughter's question that is not only kids friendly answer but uh, kids friendly answer that will instill uh, a kid's belief in Allah existence but also uh, can uh, benefit her uh, for the future. Sister has asked a very good question regarding the question posed by a daughter 12 years back and believe me to answer the young children and infants are the most difficult. They put you to task. They let the parents do their homework. Answering adults is easy, answering children is the most difficult. And your daughter asked you a very good question. Your daughter asked you, where can I meet Allah or when can I meet Allah? And you couldn't answer. Simple, you can meet Allah in Jannah. You can meet Allah in Jannah. There are hadith that if you go to Jannah, you would want to see the watch, the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can meet Allah only in Jannah. In this world, no human being can see Allah. Even with Musa alayhi salam, if you read the Quran, he wanted to see Allah. So Allah says, look at that mount, Tur. I will show my glance to that mount. And when Musa alayhi salam saw the mountain, he fainted. So no one can see Allah in this world. Tell your daughter, you can see Allah in Jannah. And then you tell her how to go to Jannah, Quran and Hadith. Regarding a second question. When I meet Allah, I will tell him to make you pregnant. You tell, you don't have to meet Allah to talk to Allah. You can talk to Allah now also, right or wrong? Dua. Dua is a hotline to Allah. You know hotline. So today, to talk to someone, you require appointment. And bigger the person, more difficult to talk. Correct? Allah hotline. Anyone can talk to Allah anytime. Hotline. He can talk to billion, million people together, no problem. We human beings cannot. Correct? So he said to talk to Allah, you don't have to wait, you can talk now itself. No dua. Simple. And why won't Allah listen to your dua? When Allah listened to the dua of Abraham alayhi salam. You know Abraham alayhi salam did dua. And his wife Sarah did dua. And they got and you have other examples. You have so many examples in the Quran. 
So what we have to realize that when a child asks, never ever give a wrong answer. Never give a wrong answer. If you don't know, you say, I don't know. Many a time, you know, when a kids play and when they stay in a building and I used to stay in 10th floor, 9th floor, now I'm on 10th floor. You know, people normally play that game. Chu, kawale, crow has taken away. Chu, crow has taken away. So the parents play with the children, crow has taken away. So the child also throws toys outside. My children never threw toys outside because I never played that game. Crow has taken away. Crow has taken away. Oh, don't come, Buddha man will come. Well, what Buddha man will come? Where is the Buddha man? So many people say things to pacify the children and they say things which are wrong. Never even tell a white lie to your child. Never. Yes, but when the children ask questions, many a times we can't reply, so you do your homework. I'm sure you could have asked to some person who had knowledge, you would have given you this answer. Where do me tell la janna? I want to ask to dua. But through do a good, all good reason. So, so that helps you in making your child pray. Okay, now if you want to talk to Allah, do your wudu, do your prayers, do your salah, good. So it's helping you to make your child come closer to Allah. You lost the opportunity, yet you can have it. Now your child may be 12 years older, correct? That means she may be 15 years, 20 years, I don't know. 16. 16. Four years when she asked you. So yet... And it's never, it's better late than never. It is better late than never. So the thing is there that you have to take this opportunity when children ask you to question, ask you any question, you get them closer to Islam, get them closer to the Quran and the Prophet so that they become get better practice Muslims. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir. Uh, my name is Muhammad Hanif. I study aviation studies and as we know that atheist is always trying to question every religious people in every religion as we know that atheist is always trying to question every religious people in every religion right and we as a believer trust God is at this in our life but if an atheist uh, come to me by face to face and ask me how can you tell me the importance of having God in our life as we can handle this life just by our, by our own mind and our own way of life sorry it, brother I cannot understand your question you're, you're reading down the atheist will ask you what question? Uh, if a friend has come to me face to face and ask me how can you tell me the importance of having God in our life as we can handle this life just by our can own? You, can you tell me the importance of having God? Yes. Having God in your life? Yeah. If an atheist come to me and ask me, how can you tell me the importance of having God in our life as we can handle this life just by our own mind and our own way of life with our own power, not by uh, the God power? Very good question. Simple question, very easy. If atheist comes and tells you that how can you tell me the importance of God and I can handle life with my mind, I don't require the help of God, how will you reply? Simple. You ask him, what is the cure of AIDS? Can he handle? Pardon me? Can he handle what is the cure of AIDS? What is the cure of AIDS? Can he handle the atheist? Pardon me? What is the cure of AIDS? You know AIDS, A-I-D-S. AIDS, oh yes. It's a disease. Yes, it's a disease. It is like you telling me when I go to a forest and I want to eat fruits. I know some are poisonous, some are not poisonous. As an intelligent man, I will ask the person who knows the forest well, which fruit is poisonous, right or wrong? If I try and eat, very shortly I will poison myself and die, right or wrong? So intelligent person always ask the person who knows. Right or wrong? Right. If when your atheist friend gets sick, does he go to a doctor or not? Why does he go? Why are you going to a doctor? You know everything. Don't go to a doctor. Ask him, why do you go to a doctor? Why are you going to school? Which school you went to? I went to school XYZ. Why? You know everything. Why did you go to school? Ask him. Huh? Yes, I will. <laughs> now when you go to school, 
the teacher teaches you God is the best to teach when you get sick you go to a doctor God is the best doctor in the world He's the best teacher in the world. He's the all-knowing. He's the all-wise. He's the shafi. He's the one to cure. When he tells you why you go to doctor, because my God tells me to go to doctor. Fasal wal is the green gun to dev. I'm going to a doctor. Why do you go to doctor? Ask him. Simple Quran. If you read the Quran with translation, all the answers are here. Very easy. Very simple. No one can take you for a ride. If you read the Quran with translation in the language you understand the best, whether it be Malay, whether it be English, whether it be Urdu, read it. Believe me, you'll get all the answers. This Quran is the solution to the problems of humanity. Many a time when someone asks you the question, you get stumped. So you said, because he is our creator. You ask him a question, when you get a new gadget, do you have equipment guide or not? I have. More complicated the machine, the more requirement of a guide, right or wrong? Right. If you allow me to call the human being a machine, it is the most complicated machine in the world, right or wrong? Yes. Don't you think it requires a guide? Does it require instruction manual? Does it require or not? Yes. Which is the instruction manual? Quran. This is the instruction manual written by the creator of the human beings, Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. Then we have the next question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Faisal, a businessman and a part-time student. Last two years, uh, I came back from Bangkok by train. Then I uh, doing solar. Uh, then uh, I I uh, I facing with with a uh, with a monk. And then I talk uh, with him. Uh, uh, then uh, before he leaving, he he he, he was told me that uh, he believes in Allah. He told me word Allah, not God. He believes in Allah, but uh, Allah create him to be monk. Then how come he can be a Muslim? I have no answer. Then quiet. Brother said he met a monk and he said Allah created him, Allah made him a monk. So you should say Allah sent me to make you Muslim. You should have talked. Good opportunity. Allah made you monk, no problem. Allah told me to do the awa with you and I'm doing the awa. You didn't do, you lost the opportunity. Now go and find him again. Inshallah. So if he says that Allah made you monk, Alhamdulillah, no problem. But and now if you accept Islam, all your sins are forgiven. You tell the monk. That see brother, if you accept Islam today, maybe your age is 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, no problem. What you did in the past, everything forgiven. All good you did is there. All the wrong you did forgiven. So you're lucky for us. We were born Muslim and we remain Muslim. We did negative, positive, we don't know for you. If you accept Islam now, khalas, everything else forgiven. You are lucky. Become Muslim. You didn't tell him. Find him now. Inshallah. <laughs> Next time when you meet a non-Muslim, known, let him go. Okay? Okay. Don't fight with him. <laughs> okay. ah, do dawa with him. Inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, Jazakallah. Yes, sister. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Satya and I'm still a student. Uh, I once before tried to prove my non-Muslim friend uh, uh, by using the scientific fact. Uh, but she questioned me, uh, she questioned me back uh, if the Quran had mentioned about all the scientific facts and the theory before about 1,400 1, years ago but why the one who discovered and developed all the theories and all the scientific facts was not non-Muslim itself? Thank you. This is a very important question that if Quran has spoken about so many scientific facts 14 years back, so why aren't Muslims who have discovered all this? Sister, if you read history, from the 8th to the 12th centuries, the Europeans called it the Dark Ages. It was dark for the Europeans, but the Muslims were the most advanced. The amount of scientific discoveries they made is phenomenal. At that time, Arabic was at speak. If you wanted to do research in science it was compulsory you had to learn arabic and if you if you go back to history it is the western media which is hiding 
if you read history we come to know that you know the words one two three four you learn in school in english language one what's it called one two three four what's it called arabic numerals you know why because previously they believed in roman numerals the indians they discovered the zero the muslims came and put the decimal point and describe the arabic numerals the one two three four we write in english is called as arabic numerals discovered by the muslims if you know about trigonometry the pythagoras theorem you know pythagoras theorem the sum the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the other two sides of a triangle it is discovered by whom by al abtusi a muslim you know the first person drew the world map it was al idrusi in 1154 when the muslim drew the world map the south pole was on top north pole down kaaba was in the center the western cartographers came and turned the map upside down north pole down north pole top south pole down yet mashallah kaaba is in the center so the first person who drew the world map was a muslim further if you read if you read about al biruni al biruni was the person who did so much so much of advances in science and technology If you know about Aristotle of the East, it Avicenna, Avicenna. It is Ali ibn Sina, Aristotle of the East, Muslim, the father of chemistry. Geber, Geber. It is not Geber. It is Jabir, Jabir ibn Hayyan. He was the father of chemistry. The word alcohol is derived from the Arabic word al gul, meaning evil spirit. Alcohol is derived from the Arabic word al gul, meaning evil spirit. The father of chemistry was a Muslim, Jabir. but when we read in the book it's gabar gabar sound like a western it's not gabar it is jabir the first person who 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 who, who had who, who calculated the circumference of the earth when the people thought the earth was flat were three brothers shakir muhammad and ahmed at the angle at the red sea if you know the person who first propounded the theory of relativity al kindi it was albert einstein who later on made made more details but the first person who propounded the theory of relativity was al kindi i can give on list of muslim scientists what is the media doing it is hiding these things because they don't want to say that islam is on top of the world what we have to do we have to go back to history and that time the people were strong on top of the world because they were close to quran and sunnah today we have gone away from quran and sunnah therefore we are down once we go back to quran and sunnah inshallah we will be on top of the world hope that answers the question sister Inshallah, we'll have a last question from all the three microphones before we end the session. Yes, brother. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Dr. Zakir. I would like to begin my question with uh, a statement. But before that, my name is Shafiq and I'm a teacher. Okay, we all know that Makkah al-Mukarramah, Madinah al-Munawarah, and Al-Aqsa al-Sharif are the three main holy sites for the Muslims. But lately, Al-Aqsa is in a very unstable state. My question is, what is the agenda of Israel to take over the land? What similarities do we have and what can we do as the Muslim ummah to apply pressure to Israel? Thank you. Was asked me the question, what is the agenda of Israel to take over Jerusalem? You have to go and ask the Israel. I am not a Israeli. You are asking the wrong person. How do I know? I do I'm hand in glove with them planning I don't know the agenda that I have to ask a person who is a political expert on all these things what we should do that we as muslim ummah should be united we should be united and if any muslim as the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's a hadith in sahih bukhari volume number 8 hadith number 6011 that the beloved prophet said the muslim ummah the believers they are merciful unto one another they are loving unto one another and they are like one body and if one part of the body gets sick the whole body feels the fever that means the whole muslim ummah is one we should be united and inshallah if you are united then we will be in a better position to help our muslim brothers who are in trouble the problem we are facing today is that we aren't united if you are united if you follow the quran and sunna inshallah at the time of the sahabas you know at the time of khulfa rashidin no non muslim ever dared played mischief with us because we were united we were one today mashallah muslims are 1.8 billion allah has given us the black gold we have the money we are the richest people in the world yet we aren't united money is not important 
we require unity we should follow quran and sunnah if we follow quran and sunnah and if we adhere to the quran and the say hadith inshallah again muslim will be on top of the world hope that answers the question can we have the next question assalamu alaikum dr zakir my name is muhammad shurah bil hassan bin rafidi i am a uniza student um, i am asking on behalf of my friend he asked me but i cannot give an solid answer all I can say is Wallahu alam, no for the comment. Uh, he asked me, uh, what if uh, in afterlife we realize that we are in the wrong religion? Thank you. Well, ask the question that what if in the afterlife we realize we are in the wrong religion? That's a big problem. That's the reason do research now. Do research now, otherwise you cannot come back in life. This test is only once. That's the reason tell your friend that you have to research now. What Allah has given the brig. Allah has given grey matter to us. Use your brain to find out the right religion. And if you find the right religion, stick to it. So with whatever knowledge Allah has given us, if you use your logic, reasoning, you would only come to know, as Allah says in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the Dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Almighty God, in the sight of Allah, is Islam. Islam is the only right religion. I have given you so many scientific facts. Whatever knowledge we have in the world, we can prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and prove to them that Quran is the word of God and we have to follow the Quran. Inshallah, we will go to Jannah in the next life. Inshallah. Hope that answers the question. Then we have the last question, sister. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Nur Al-Hafiza binti Abu Sama. I am a student. So uh, my nephew once asked me, uh, Auntie Fiza, where is Allah? So I am, I, ha I got no answer. So I stumbled over Quran and I found a surah, a saj uh, a surah, surah uh, which is surah as sajdah And I forgot which verse, uh, but it mentioned, Thumma uh, stawa anil ash. So I am wondering, uh, does Allah live in Arsh? And what what does what does it mean by uh, as Astawa? And what does it mean by Al Arsh? Uh, so the next question is by uh, my friend's question. I'm sorry, uh, she wrote it. Uh, I see division in Muslim today. There are some who follows four madhab and some are Wahhabi. Uh, problems started when they are telling each other wrong so what, what what is your advice and the third question is i'm sorry but this is my friend's question uh, as a muslim doctor you are a muslim doctor uh, what is your stand uh, on vaccines that's all this so the three question last question she has three in one the first question asked by her niece that where is allah and she stumbled across the verse of surah said that allah is on us and that's correct that the answer of yours is correct that Allah is established on his throne. But Allah also says in Surah Shura, chapter number 42, verse number 11, There is nothing whatever like him. Allah hears and sees. But Allah does not hear and see like you and me, like our ears and our eyes. So you say, how is the arsh? You start thinking of a chair. How is Allah's arsh? Allah wal. So Quran says Allah is on arsh. That is the right answer. And this arsh extends throughout. We have a thinking, you know, arsh how. So whatever description is given in the hadith, we accept it. We don't add to it. There are various hadith. There is a hadith of Muhammad sallallahu that the lady came to the, uh, her lady was there. And Prophet wanted to test her. Is she a mu'min or not? So Allah, so the Prophet asked her, where is Allah? She said on top. The Prophet said, she has iman. That's the reason when we do dua, we put our hand on the top. Correct? So you can give the answer, Allah is on top, that's also correct. Allah is on arsh, that's also correct. Both answers are correct. Oh, so the, I could say to my nephew, Allah is everywhere. No. No. Oh. Now you're falling into a trap. I know there are some people who say Allah is everywhere, but there's no text. Yes, Allah is everywhere by power. Mm. What does Hadith say, Allah is on top? I know there are some people who do say. But what we have to realize that when talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not, do not add anything of your own. It's very dangerous. Some people explain, yes, Allah by power is everywhere. He has power over everything. Many verses. 
But Quran says he's on earth, he's on earth. Allah is on top, the Hadith says Allah is on top. It's better not to add, the Prophet said, don't waste too much time on discussing on about Allah. And you say something, you make a mistake. Best is to repeat the verse of the Quran, very safe. There's no way in the Quran which says Allah is everywhere. I know there are many Muslims who believe in that. It is safe to repeat a verse of the Quran, you can never be wrong. Regarding the second question. Second question was vaccine, or third question was vaccine. Uh, the trick question on vaccines. The second question is about the mother. Mother, that there are so many mothers and each mother is criticizing the, each other. I have given the talk on unity in the Muslim Ummah on the 10th of this month. I gave in Tarangana, Kuala Tarangana. And there I said that all the four Imams, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, Imam Shafi, may Allah have mercy on him, Imam Malik, may Allah have mercy on him, uh, and as well as the fourth Imam, Imam <laughs> Ahmed ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on him. And there were many other Imams, these four were more famous. All the Imams, they said that if you find a hadith which is sahih, that is my madhab. All the Imma said that if you find any of my opinion, any of my fatwa, which is against the book of Allah and the hadith of the Prophet, ignore my fatwa. They did not come to fight. They were all loving. They gave the opinion. And, they all, and if you analyze more than 95%, all the opinions are the same. They may differ in 2, 3, 4%. And all the Imma said that if you find my opinion, which is against the Quran, and the say hadith you ignore my opinion they came to spread the deen and get the muslim ummah closer to quran and sunnah unfortunately we are fighting the only way we can come close allah says in surah imran chapter 3 verse 103 hold the rope of allah strongly and be not divided hope that answers the question regarding use of vaccine if the vaccine contains anything which is haram and if it's a drug which is going to save your life this is the ruling if you are using a medicine and if that medicine is the only medicine that can save your life, even if it contains alcohol, it is permitted. If it contains certain things like pig, if it's insulin, if you have an option of bovine insulin, cow insulin, no problem. But if you have no other option, and if you use a drug, even though it contains alcohol or contains something which is haram, and if that drug is the only drug that can save you, it is permitted in Islam. Otherwise, in a normal circumstance, it is haram. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhra dawan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.